Welcome to our year-end retreat. The topic of this year's year-end retreat is Third Order Women, Then and Now. Although we are Third Order Franciscans, we are much more familiar with Claire of Assisi and Agnes of Prague, both Second Order religious women, than we are with Third Order lay women of the first generations of the Franciscan movement. And yet, our own mother Frances started out as a third order lay woman before founding our third order congregation of religious women. Today, as we look at the lives of a few of the early lay third order women, we hope to, do, to discover how they can help us enhance our own third order call today. Our first presenter, Dr. Darlene Prides, is an associate professor of Christian spirituality at the Franciscan School of Theology in Berkeley, California. She received her BA and MA degrees at the University of Southern California and her PhD at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. As a Catholic lay woman, Darlene is especially interested in teaching and researching historical cases of lay religious leaders. She has published several articles and a book on lay preaching within the medieval church. Darlene has received many research grants, including a Fulbright Fellowship to Italy, a research fellowship at the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Research Grant to research at the Vatican Film Library at St. Louis University. Especially relevant to today's topic, Darlene has written Women of the Streets, Early Franciscan Women and Their Mendicant Vocations, in which she treats of significant women who lived as itinerant lay Franciscan women. From their association with the early friars, these women embraced the Franciscan charism and took to the streets to proclaim the gospel as part of their vocation. Our second presenter, Sister Helen Budzik, is a member of our congregation and highly qualified to speak about Mother Frances Bachman. Helen received an MA in theology from St. Bonaventure University and a second MA in pastoral studies from Loyola University in Chicago, Illinois. In the course of ministry, she has been an elementary school teacher and principal, a secondary school theology teacher, a pastoral associate, and master catechist teacher in three different dioceses. Presently, Helen is a staff member of the Spiritual Center in Aston and the candidate director on our initial formation team. In her spare time, Helen has co-authored Guidelines for the Study of St. Clair of Assisi and written an article on Franciscan hermitage included in the book Franciscan Solitude. Having been a member of the team of sisters who planned and gave retreats about Mother Francis throughout the congregation has given Helen a wealth of knowledge about our foundress. As we enter into our year-end retreat, the Theology Committee hopes that we truly immerse ourselves into the prayer, the stories, the reflection, and the action of what God is opening up for us as individuals, as area chapters, and as a congregation. We also hope that we will provide ourselves with the quiet time necessary 
to make this a deep and enriching retreat. Hello, my name is Darlene Prides, and I am pleased to welcome you to this retreat um, that I've entitled Women's Franciscan Spirituality, Stories Beyond Claire. Last year, you, in your annual retreat, you used storytelling to explore immigration. This year, I would like to use storytelling to explore prayer, to use storytelling as, in fact, a form of devotional practice. And the focus of our storytelling is going to be you. You, the Third Order regular sisters, the lives that you've lived, and the lives of women who have lived this tradition in the past. I have divided this retreat into two main parts. The first part I'm, I'm calling taking a new look at familiar images. We're going to look at some family photos in some ways. We're going to look at how family photos help us tell the stories of our lives, tell the stories of our tradition. In the second part, I'm going to tell you some stories, hopefully stories of women that you've heard about. And I'm going to challenge you to learn those stories to tell them yourselves, because these are women in your tradition, third order regular tradition, um, that it's important to know. Rose of Viterbo, Margaret of Cortona, Angela Foligno, and Sancho of Naples. Four women who were famous in their lifetimes. And what do we know about them today? Um, not a lot if you're not a scholar of Franciscan spirituality. And so I'm going to be telling the stories and asking you to start telling them yourselves. It's a privilege and it's an honor and we connect when we see other kinds of pictures. Pictures from deeper in our tradition. So photographs, that's more about life stories and we can um, talk about our own lives and our development. But what happens when we look at pictures in the Franciscan tradition? And what are the stories that we tell when we look at them? And how do we feel? I want to touch on that, that visceral quality, Celeste, that you mentioned. Pictures often evoke an emotion, not just an intellectual reaction. So I'd like to turn to these photographs of images that are all found in uh, the lower basilica of San Francesco in Assisi. They are pretty popular photographs or images. The image of Francis is done by Cimabue, 13th, 14th century. They're all from around the same time. And then these two images of who we often think is Claire. And these images are often produced next to each other. Do they seem familiar to you? Yeah. yeah. And, and what are some of the feelings that you have when you look at these pictures? Family. Family? Connection. Connection, yeah. Home, at homeness. At home, mm hmm. Mm hmm. I remember standing in front of those pictures in Assisi and uh, the sense of connectedness. Um, that was there. The sense of connectedness, and it's through those, those um, frescoes. Mm -hmm. Both the upper and lower basilicas are jam-packed with frescoes. And in some ways, the you know, first time I was there, it was a little jarring. There was a lot to look at. Mm -hmm. But when you actually take the time to focus on just one or a grouping of one, and to allow that image to come one into oneself, there is this sense of connection, and I would say this prayerful connection. Mm -hmm. And for me, these images also evoke stories. I start thinking about the stories I know of Francis and Claire. So it's this visceral response to the fresco itself, 
But uh, there is this mental um, response of telling stories. The Chimabui Francis always makes me think of what a gentle soul he was. There's a gentleness in his eyes and in his face that resonates deeply with me. And in these images of Claire, contemplative figure. So what happens if I tell you that this is not Claire? Some of you might know this. And yet we often see this image marketed on cards, postcards, on web pages, um, on all sorts of things. We see both of these images labeled as Claire. In fact, that is a truism in Franciscan studies to, to talk about Francis and Claire as the masculine and feminine versions, two sides of the Franciscan charism. Claire, of course, lived out her vocation within a monastery in a monastic context. And especially for a congregation of third order regular Franciscans, is there another model that is better suited as that feminine ideal or feminine model, feminine foundress of the Franciscan charism? Yeah, it's, I, th yeah, I think there is. <laughs> There's no, no, uh, no uh, trying to hide where I'm coming from. And in fact, if you look very closely at both of these images, again, found in the lower basilica, look closely at the halos. And you'll see seven suns depicted in the halo of this woman. Seven suns also depicted in this halo. Seven suns. Sette soli in Italian. Sette soli. Also conflated to be a family name, Sette soli. There is a woman who is somewhat well known in our Franciscan story, Jacoba. Lady Jacoba, Jacoba, whichever pronunciation you'd like to use. And it is quite likely that these images are not Claire at all. But instead, they're Lady Jacoba. Jacoba de Sete Soli. And so what happens to our understanding of our tradition as Franciscan women when we see Francis next to Jacoba, not next to Claire. We often see Francis and Claire together so often that the two names come together so quickly. But I want to jolt us out of that assumption that it's Francis and Claire that come together so quickly. And in fact, I'd like to say that it's Francis and Jacoba. So I'd like to read you a story and I'd like to ask you to focus in on this image of Jacoba while I read this story. This story comes from one of the several accounts of Lady Jacoba, this one from the Assisi com compilation. These are stories that were told by people who knew Francis and that were finally written down. The manuscript comes from the 14th century, so it's rather old. But more importantly, it's to note that these were first-hand accounts. One day, Blessed Francis called his companions to himself. And this was near his death. He knew he was approaching his death. And he said, you know how faithful and devoted Lady Jacoba de Satesili was and is to me now. Therefore, I believe she would consider it a great favor and consolation if you notified her about my condition. Above all, tell her to send me some cloth for a tunic of religious cloth, the cloth of ashes. 
like the cloth made by the Cistercian monks in the region beyond the Alps. He got very specific there. Haver also sends some of that confection, which he has often made for me when I was in the city. This confection made of almonds, sugar, and honey. That spiritual woman was a holy woman devoted to God. She belonged to one of the more noble and wealthy families of the entire city. Through the merits and words of blessed Francis, she had obtained such grace from God that she seemed like another Magdalene, always full of tears and devotion for the love of God. After the letter was written, as dictated by Francis, while one brother was looking for another one to deliver the letter, there was a knock at the door. When one of the brothers opened the gate, he saw Lady Jacoba, who had heard, hurried from the city to visit Blessed Francis. With great joy, the brother immediately went to tell Blessed Francis that Lady Jacoba had come to visit him with her son and with many other people. What shall we do, Father, he said. Shall we allow her to enter and come in here? He said this because Blessed Francis a long time ago had ordered that in that place no women should enter the cloister out of respect and devotion to that very place. Francis answered him, This command need not be observed in the case of this lady whose faith and devotion made her come here from so far away. And in this way, she came in to see Blessed Francis, crying many tears in his presence. It was amazing. She brought with her shroud cloth, that is gray colored cloth for a tunic, and all the other things that were written in the letter. This made the brothers greatly marvel at the holiness of Blessed Francis. While I was praying, Lady Jacoba told her the brothers, a voice within me said, Go visit your father, Blessed Francis, without delay and hurry, because if you delay long, you will not find him alive. Moreover, take such and such cloth for his tunic, as well as the ingredients for making this particular confection. Take with you also a great quantity of wax and incense. Blessed Francis did not have incense written in the letter, but the Lord himself willed to inspire the lady as a reward and consolation for her soul. In this way, we would more readily recognize the great holiness of that saint, that poor man whom the Heavenly Father wished to honor so greatly in the days he was dying. He inspired the king to travel with gifts to honor the child, his beloved son, in the days of his birth and his poverty. So, too, he willed to inspire this noble lady in a faraway region to travel with gifts to honor and venerate the glorious and holy body of his servant, the saint who loved and followed the poverty of his beloved son with so much fervor and love in life and in death. One day, that lady made that confection the Holy Father wanted to eat. He ate only a little of it, however, since he was very near death, and daily his body was becoming weaker on account of his illness. She also had made candles made which uh, would burn around his holy body after his death. From the cloth she had brought for his tunic, the brothers made him the tunic in which he was buried. He himself ordered the brothers to sew pieces of sackcloth on the outside of it as a sign and example of most holy humility and poverty. It happened as it pleased God that during the same week that Lady Jacoba arrived, Blessed Francis passed to the Lord. It's a poignant story, isn't it? A story that points to deepest faith, uh, deepest conviction, and trust. Lady Jacoba trusted her intuition 
She knew that God was speaking to her and she knew she was to go to Francis and be with him, tend to him as he lay dying. There is an intimacy, physical intimacy, certainly not inappropriate intimacy, but an intimacy because she knew what he needed and she brought them. She brought herself, she brought these things, she made this cookie, this candy, this almond candy, and she sat with him. She sat with him, probably held his hand, comforted him, comforted him as he passed from this life. What a profound spiritual calling. And what a poignant story. A story that I think is at the foundation of the third order regular life. The vow that you take, the lives that you live, were modeled by Lady Jacoba. So some of the characteristics I highlighted were conviction, confidence. Both of those, I think, rested in the deepest of prayer and reverence, trust. And what has happened to her story? What has happened to our recognition of her in these images? How often do we tell the story of Lady Jacoba? And how often do we have images of her around us to inspire us in our faith? Images like these, paintings that are in the basilica, paintings that could be hanging in our homes, our local convents, in our mother house. But also images that I'd like to think of more broadly. Um, images of Lady Jacoba in our daily prayer life. How often do we remember her? and her life, and her model for us in our personal daily prayer life. How often do we turn to her and bring her into our community liturgies? These could be at our local convent or in the congregation as a whole. How often do we pray with her in mind as we gaze on this image? This image that some of us may have on prayer cards or in posters. How often do we engage with Lady Jacoba as the foundress of our tradition of third order regular? For me, I continue to keep growing into that, growing into my awareness of her influence on me. And those of you who have heard me speak before know that I often begin my talk, when I talk about my book, Women of the Streets, it's a mea culpa. Lady Jacoba's not in here. I forgot. I forgot to bring her in here. And that's what happens. People forget about Lady Jacoba. Kind of like that photograph I showed you of uh, my confirmation class. Didn't write the names on the back. Her name's not on these pictures. So, so how easily we can rename these pictures and then therefore rename our tradition. 
So I'd like to ask you to reflect very deeply on this image. And if I could ask the camera to stay focused on this image and use gazing as a form of prayer, traditional form of Christian prayer, to gaze on an image and to see Lady Jacoba next to Francis and to gaze on Jacoba herself. How is it that you would tell her story? What does her story mean to you? I read a story out of a medieval text because reading stories is one way we tell stories. Way back in elementary school and and even preschool, teachers would read us stories out of a book. It can be engaging. And now, how do we tell her story ourselves off the page? What does she mean to us?